Now, what I'm teaching you is what you would get if you were at a Bible college. I mean, we're getting deep into this. We're going to look at it, and I want to look at all the situations. We're going to look at all the positions. Um, and let me say this from the beginning. We do not, um, uh, you know, want to have a, an attitude that we know it all or anything like that. I've got good friends. There, there's people in this church that believe we're going to go through the tribulation and good people who love the Lord and so I don't believe that but um, you know I listen to them and they listen to me and uh, we're both pretty stubborn so we're not going to change our opinions but it's okay to disagree on this stuff it's, it's not like Jesus dying on the cross now, yeah, there's no disagreement there there's no disagreement on the blood of Christ the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins so there's a lot of things, there's no room to compromise, but when we come to what, and by the way, this is called eschatology, the study of last things, the study of end times, and, and I love studying that, so we're going to do a lot of talking about it, especially on Sunday nights, and I believe, and, and people have asked me this um, a lot recently, they said, do you believe we're close to the end? And I do. And we may not be. We may be here another hundred years. We, nobody knows, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Nobody knows really when it is, but I just feel like it is. A lot is happening. Um, the greatest sign of the second coming of Christ, and the, when, when I say the second coming of Christ, I'm not talking about the rapture. I'm talking about what I talked about this morning, where Jesus is going to come out of the clouds and come to this earth. Um, but the rapture, in my view, will take place seven years before that. So if I say Christmas is coming soon, what does that mean? That means Thanksgiving's going to come even sooner because it comes before Christmas. So when I say the second coming of Christ, there are signs that tell us about the second coming of Christ. Well, he looks like he's going to have a good time <laughs> with the chocolate cake. Uh, uh, and I think they will have a good time down there. But uh, we... Um, the, the greatest sign is the fact that the nation of Israel is now back in their homeland. And that was predicted all through the Old Testament. And in uh, May of 1948, the nation of Israel came back. And so now we're seeing the timepiece of God's clock is the nation of Israel. And that's one reason I want us to look in the future. We're going to do a little bit of studying about the nation of Israel and a little of their history and some of their customs, because a lot of it has to do with um, what we're talking about uh, with the rapture. So I gave, uh, I gave out all that I had of, of the, the forms that I gave you a few weeks ago. Um, I can get more later, but I, I, I ran out. Um, that's why I encourage you, get a notebook and put all these in there, because you're going to have some good stuff. But um, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our study tonight. Father, give us understanding of your word. We want to know. We want to um, understand. And Lord, we know that you are a teacher. The Spirit of God uh, guides us into all truth. And so, Lord, help us to understand. And Lord, not just to have knowledge, but that it might affect the way we believe, that it might change our lives that we might look at this world at a whole different perspective. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to review just a little bit, we were talking about the rapture. Is the word rapture mentioned in the English Bible? No, it's not mentioned in the English Bible. It is mentioned in the Latin Bible, which we call the Vulgate. Vulgate comes from the word vulgar, actually, which means common. And so it was the common language um, um, to, uh, it, well, it was written to, to the, in uh, the Roman Empire. But anyway, it is mentioned in that Bible because the word rapture is a Latin word for the word that we, mean, that we use to be caught up. Even though the word is not mentioned in the Bible, the principle is taught there. And so... Um, uh, we, we see in the Bible where we'll be caught up or gathered together in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's really a weird thing. We're going to be lifted up so quick people won't see us. We'll be there and all of a sudden we'll be gone. 
in the twinkling of an eye, not the blinking of an eye. A twinkling is quicker than a blinking. Okay, just take my word on it. Uh, but uh, uh, it's going to happen quickly. And we said that Jesus promised that in, in John before he was about to go to the cross. He said, uh, Don't, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Now, where was he going? Going to the Father's house. Where's that at? Heaven. He said, where I'm going, you can't go. You can't go right now. But he said, I'm going to come and get you and gather you unto myself that where I am, where, where is he going to be? Heaven. There you may be also. So that teaching gives us a promise that he's going to come and get us and take us to heaven. Now, if we believe, and that's one of the points, if you believe that we're going to go through the tribulation and um, we're going to be raptured at the end of the tribulation, then when are we going to go to the Father's house? So we'll, we'll look at different problems uh, with, with different views. I'm even going to share with you some problems with my view because a lot of people say there's some difficulties, and we'll look at those, but not tonight. But um, we did say that there's a promise of going to the Father's house, and that also there is um, uh, the, the, the teaching of a Jewish wedding where uh, it, the custom was that you made a covenant with the bride and actually her father and her family, really. You didn't just marry the girl, you married the family. And that they would sit down and, uh, you know, they would get engaged. And sometimes they would drink a glass of, of wine to... Uh, seal the deal kind of and then the groom would leave and and go to his father's house and usually they would prepare an addition to the father's house uh, add on a room where they would live until one day they'd have their own house and if someone said when's the wedding if they asked the bride when's your wedding what would she say don't know if you asked the groom when's your wedding he'd say don't know why? He had to wait till the father told him he was ready. He'd go back and start working and getting a place ready. And when the father said, okay, it's ready, go get your bride. And often they would go at midnight. And they could take a whole group with them. And uh, they would um, uh, sometimes have torches. And they would sh somebody would shout and say, the bridegroom's coming. And she would get ready, you know, get her makeup on and get ready as quick as she could. And she would go out and meet her, uh, her groom. And then they would have the wedding ceremony. And then they would have seven days of a feast. And it was seven days of celebration and feasting. And so that's what we believe the rapture. Jesus has made a promise, a covenant with us. And also, I, I forgot to mention, the, 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 the groom had to pay the bride's daddy some money to, before uh, he could uh, get his bride. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sins. So the mid-trib is right in the middle of the tribulation. So what are some of the problems? Why do I not agree with that? And what are some of the problems? The, the theory of the mid-trib comes, you remember the two witnesses the Bible says? God is going to have two super witnesses. They're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Some people have speculated who they are. Some people think it's, I believe one of them is Elijah. Because the Bible does say that Elijah will come back and restore some of the Old Testament things. I do believe Elijah is one of them. And I believe that uh, the other one could be Enoch, could be Moses, it could be anybody really. We don't really know who it is. But the Bible says there are going to be two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two lampstands throughout the Bible. They're mentioned in Zechariah. They're also mentioned in Revelation. But they're going to be killed by the Antichrist. Uh, and the Bible says about midway through the tribulation, they're going, to, uh, uh, they're going to leave their bodies out in the open to decay for about three, uh, for three days. And uh, then what's going to happen? They're going to be raptured. As a matter of fact... Uh, uh, Rock, you said, uh, I, I said there were seven raptures, or actually eight, because I, did, I, I forgot about them. But they will be raptured. So the mid-tribbers believe 
that that's when the rapture will take place and everybody will be raptured when those guys are raptured. I, I don't believe that. And a lot, a lot of revelation, some people take it symbolically. As a matter of fact, there's some people that believe in the book of Revelation. It was written about um, 90 or 95 A.D. In other words, the first century of the church was almost at the end of the century. And so most of the church back in Paul's day didn't have the book of Revelation. And so during that time, they were really being persecuted by the Roman church, the Roman church, excuse me, the Roman Empire. And so uh, a lot of people believe they spoke in codes and all of Revelation is symbolism. Now, I don't believe that. There are some things that are symbolism when the text tells you they are. But when the Bible says seven years, I believe it's seven years. And um, when it says the, the sun's going to turn dark, I believe the sun's going to turn dark. I, and, and most evangelicals today believe in a literal interpretation of Scripture. Where the Bible says what it means, it means what it says. So I do not hold to the position that that's when they're going to be raptured. But some of you have asked, how do these people get these ideas? And so I'm going to, going to share that with you. Then here's another one. They believe it's going to be in the middle of the tribulation because in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, it talks about the trumpet judgments. There's going to be seven trumpet judgments. Angels are going to blow a trumpet. It's actually more like a horn, like a ram's horn. But they're going to blow it. And each time he blows it, there's going to be an awful plague that comes on the earth. And so there is a last plague judgment and a last trumpet. And so they say, the Bible says, uh, at the last trump is when the rapture is going to take place. And so they say, that is the last trumpet. But uh, that's not the last trumpet. There's going to be trumpets during the millennial reign, like I talked about this morning. As a matter of fact, every year they're going to have a feast of tabernacles. They're going to blow the trumpet there. And by, this is not the trumpet of God. This is a trumpet of judgment. And when it's talking about the last trumpet, it's talking about at Rosh Hashanah, they have several trumpets that are blown. And the last trumpet calls the people together. And as a matter of fact, you don't really know when that trumpet's going to blow. And uh, we mentioned that there are military terms um, when you're talking about last trump, last trumpet. Um, in the army, there is a trumpet to get you up in the morning. What's it called? Anybody know? Reveille, isn't it? And then at the end of the day, there is a trumpet. It's the last trump. What is it called? Taps. Taps. Have y'all y'all know what I'm talking about by taps? They play it at funerals a lot of time. So, see how military talks about trumpet. There was a trumpet in those days. You played a certain trumpet, certain sound, mean charge. Another trumpet means retreat. That would have been my favorite one, I believe. Uh, I come from a long list of people that ran during the war, amen? My great-grandfather was shot in the back by the Yankees. Why in the back? Because he was running, that's why. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know if he's shot in the back. He was shot, but I don't know. I'm, I kind of kid about that. But anyway, they think this trumpet is going to be the last trumpet. And so that's where they get it. And so they say the rapture is going to take place in the middle because they believe that's when that trumpet's going to sound. And that's the last trumpet. So that is the uh, going to be the rapture. Um, um, now this view, a lot of people in this view believe that the tribulation is only going to be three and a half years. And there's quite a few people that believe this. I believe the tribulation is going to last seven, but the last three and a half is called the great tribulation. It's going to be really, really bad. But the first three and a half isn't going to be a, a, a cakewalk either. And we do find in Revelation 6, verse 16, you can see it down under number three, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now this is talking in Revelation chapter 6 at the very first before all these trumpets. And so, uh, and it clearly says this is the wrath of the Lamb. So this is God's wrath. Now, 
Christians go through troubled times. We go through tribulation. There's a lot of, see, some of my friends, they're like, Carl, you're a sissy. You don't want to go through the tribulation. Right. I don't want to go through it. But they're like, you know, real men, they can handle uh, the tribulation and all. And you're just a sissy. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be a sissy. Uh, but I don't want to go through the tribulation either. But, you know, it, it has nothing to do with that. I believe the Bible teaches this. You know, I'm not trying to get at there's Y'all just don't want persecution. Y'all just aren't, aren't strong enough and man enough to handle tribulation. Listen, there will be tribulation on all of us. But the tribulation comes from the world, not from Jesus. We are the bride of Christ. He is not going to abuse his bride. Wrath will not come from God on us. Now, the devil hates us, and the world hates us, and the world will never like us. I go to some church growth conference. You say, oh, you want your church to grow? Listen, man, I want us to grow. We're going to try. That's why we're learning about evangelism. And by the way, I heard Tim say, the devil will fight us. He will. When we get serious about sharing our faith, the devil will fight us. So you might as well get ready for him. We're going to run up against him. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But um, so, so we're going to get persecution from the world. And as, as we get closer, it's going to get worse. People are going to uh, hate us. And I go to these church growth conferences and they say, we need to win the world by getting the world to like us. And let's do all these things so the world will like us. Jesus said they will not like us. They're going, to, they're going to hate us. So anyway, the Bible says in Daniel 9, 27, it talks about a seven year. He'll make a covenant for one week. And we said last week, I think, that a week to the Jews meant, like we say, a decade means 10 years. A week uh, in some places in the Old Testament meant sevens. So it meant like seven years. So there will be a whole seven year period where the Antichrist will make a peace treaty for seven years. By the way, I was hearing a guy, there's a guy named Walid Shabbat. I may not pronounce that exactly right. He's a former PLO terrorist, but he got saved. And he was talking about uh, the Muslims have a, uh, a deal where they will sign ag agreements with the key to, um, to break that uh, halfway through, halfway through. So, anyway, that, that it, it may be uh, Islamic um, covenant with the Jews. Uh, some people say that won't happen; they'd never do it. But it's happened before. They made a covenant with e Egypt. Y'all remember Anwar Sadat? He got killed. He got shot, but he did sign a peace treaty with the Israelis. But it wound up killing him. So. Um, Number four, now this is one that we'll see in both of them. Number four, here's a problem I have. It destroys eminence, the doctrine of eminence. Now, if you ask a post-tribber, and you may be one here today, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to say that you're, well, yeah, I am saying you're wrong. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying uh, I'm, I'm necessarily right because I, I love you in the Lord, and we can disagree on this. I have fun with guys. We talk about it. You know, I, I'm out of here. Y'all can stay for the tribulation if you want to. But I'm out of here. You know what? Really, it doesn't matter whether we believe in it or not. If the rapture is pre-trib, they're going up too if they're saved. And if I'm wrong and they're right, guess what? I'm going through the tribulation <laughs> regardless of my view. So uh, uh, any, anyway, it destroys the doctrine of eminence. Now, what is the doctrine of eminence? And they would say there is no such thing. There is no doctrine of eminence. There are no two comings of Christ. There is no, we believe in a, a coming in the air where we meet Christ in the air and we go to the Father's house for seven years. They believe that Jesus is just coming. Uh, the post-tribbers believe he's just coming one time. But the doctrine of eminence is this. It means that Jesus could come at any moment. There is nothing that has to happen before the rapture. Um, I wrote an article right before our revival, and I said, what if Jesus came back the day after our revival? Just a hypothetical question to think about. How would you live? 
Like, if you knew Jesus was coming back on Friday, how would that change your life? Would you live this week a little different? I guarantee you we all would, wouldn't we? But uh, uh, so I, I said, I, I was trying to get people to think about what if Jesus came back on a Monday? And I, was, I got an email back from this guy, and he was like, Jesus cannot come back today because, first of all, the Antichrist has to come, and all these things has to happen, so you don't have to worry about Jesus coming back. He can't come back today. He does not believe in the doctrine of imminence because the doctrine of imminence believes he could come back today in the rapture to get us. And Paul taught this in the Bible. Paul said, be awake. Don't go to sleep. Jesus said it. He said, when they said, when are these things happening? And Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. Not even the angels in heaven and then he says something that is very, very profound. He basically said, I don't even know when it's going to happen. Now, you know, we teach in theology, theology, there's a big word called omniscience. Omniscience means Jesus knows everything. But he said he didn't know when the time was. He said, only the Father knows. Again, that goes back to the Jewish wedding. Now, how do, you, how do we, if Jesus is God and Jesus knows everything, then how come he didn't know this? I believe this. Jesus chose when he came to earth and took on the form of a man, he chose to make himself a little lower than the angels, the Bible says. In other words, he gave up some things. And one of the things was he gave up the knowledge of when he was going to return. Now, I believe he knows now. But at that time, he said, not even the angels in heaven. Why was it important? And he said, it's not for us to know. Everybody's trying to figure out, when is it? When, when's the day? You know? I uh, was looking through some old books last week. Um, I went into the garage. I got a box of books, and I'm trying to put some books up in my office. And uh, there was a book, I saw it, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Christ Will Return in 1988. Well, guess what? He didn't come back in 1988. And that guy who wrote that book, now nobody believes anything he says because he lost his credibility. But God the Father does not want us to know. What if 2,000 years ago the, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, when are you coming back? And he says, uh, I'm not coming back for 2,000 years. How would that have changed the church? We would be relaxed. It would probably be a lot more corrupt. Hey, man, we got 2,000 years. We don't have to worry. Jesus didn't come back for 2,000 years. Um, what if I said, Jesus is not coming back for seven years? We know we have to go through the tribulation. Tribulation hasn't started yet. We, hadn't, we don't know who the Antichrist is. He has not been revealed. That's got to happen before the, uh, before the tribulation. So I get up and preach, and I say, um, we know that Jesus will not come back for seven years. you got seven years. Now, I'll tell you how some people would react. If I'm lost out there and I'm hearing that, man, i got seven years. I don't have to get saved right now. I'm going to live it up. I'm going to do what I want to. I'll live for myself. And maybe after five and a half years, I'll get sick. But you know what? I believe I'll go six. Squeeze one more year of having fun and sin. And that is how people would react. And so God the Father knows we don't need to know the day. It would not be good for us to know the day. It's good for us to think that Jesus could come today. You know why? It'll help us live better. Long time ago, when I was 18 years old, uh, I went to a, a, a Free Will Baptist Church. As a matter of fact, the church that's about to build right down here, I went to that church. They were in Woodbine, and it was a good church, and I love that church. I love my pastor. But he, he used to preach against going to the picture show. You know, you don't drink, smoke, chew, or go to the picture show, you know? Man, I like going to the picture show, you know? <laughs> He used to say, he used to say, I know, you know, stay home, read your Bible, you know. And uh, there's, no, there's no flash in the pan <laughs> like uh, on the movie screen, you know. 
So one Sunday night, we had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Man, I didn't miss. I was going to church. I was a new Christian. And I had my, my cousin got saved about the same time I did, Bobby Hardiman. And so uh, one night, uh, Sunday night, our preacher, Brother Cordell, said, I'm going to be out of town, but y'all be here in church anyway, but I've got to go out of town. And so, you know, I had my Bible ready. I was wanting to go to church. But Bobby Hardiman was full of the devil. And he came up to me and he said, Carl, let's skip church. And let's go uh, watch a movie. What's showing, Bobby? The Godfather. Oh, man, I've heard about that movie. That's pretty good. I love, you know, I love things blowing up. And, you know, he, you know, I'd heard that, you know, they cut off the horse's head and put it in the bed. You know, y'all have, have seen the movie, right? You know, and, uh, you know, make, make, I made him an offer he couldn't refuse, you know. Uh, Marlon Brando and all, and then I said, Bobby, we should go to church. And he said, come on, man, Brother Cordell's gone, and let, let's go. And so, you know, he tempted me, and I surrendered to the temptation. But, you know, I was in there, and I was watching that movie, and I could hear Brother Cordell preaching. Don't go to the picture show. And what if Jesus comes back, and you're in the picture show? And I was thinking, what if the rapture takes place? And I'm in here, and what am I going to tell Jesus, you know? I'm, I'm, you know, and so I didn't enjoy that movie. I wanted it to uh, get over with, and I wanted to get out of there. And I tell you, I had a good pastor. You know why? He found out about it. And he called me on the phone and said, uh, Carl, I want to see you in my office. I get down there to the church, and there's Bobby. I said, what are you doing here? He said, Brother Cordell called me. He said he wants to see me in his office. <laughs> I said, uh-oh. And he called us in there, and he said, uh, I hear y'all wasn't at church Sunday. Where were y'all? And uh, we said, well, we went to a movie. And uh, he didn't chew us out, but he said, you know what? You young men, I believe God could use you, and God has some great things for you, but y'all don't need to be skipping church and going to the movies. Y'all need to be in church on Sunday. So he, he gave us a good little lecture. And, uh, but the point I'm making is the fact that you know that Jesus may come at any moment, it'll help you live right. It'll give you a sense of purity. And so Jesus wants us to have the idea of the imminent return of Jesus, that Jesus could come at any time. And that's one of the problems I have with the post-trib especially, because they believe, no, Jesus couldn't come back today. No, we've got to go through tribulation. So if I'm preaching to people, you need to get saved, you need to trust Christ. Why? You're not guaranteed another day. Jesus could come back at any moment. Well, no, he can't. you got seven years. You see how it's better for us not to know? Now, I tell you, I love, I love studying and learning, and I think we're getting close, but Jesus does not want us to know the day. It would not be good for the church to know the day. Now, if we believe in a post-trib, I can tell you the exact day. Because the Bible says it'll be exactly 300 no, not 300. It'll be three and a half years from the time the Antichrist comes into the temple at the abomination desolation. And it'll be 360 day years, the Jewish uh, year. You can just add it up. I don't know how many days it is, but you could figure up the exact days. And you could say, I know exactly when Jesus is coming. But for the rapture, we, we, we don't know. So... That's the doctrine of eminence, and that is one of the cornerstones of pre-tribulation. We believe Jesus could come at any time, and uh, there's some that don't. Before we go on, any questions? Is this all clear? Okay, so that's the mid-trib. Okay. Um, well, let, well, let's get, hit these last two. It can lead to debts, date setting. Like I said, you'd know the exact day. And number six, you can't find the church in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 11. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of Revelation, it talks about the 24 elders. Who are those 24 elders? Well, we know they're the redeemed. They're robed in, in white righteousness. They've been redeemed. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Let me tell you something. That's the church. It's the church. 
and, and you see them there, but you don't hear anything about the church uh, f from, from those verses, uh, and, uh, those chapters up until uh, f from chapter 6 to 11. There's no mention of the church. Now, why is there a tribulation? There's several reasons. One is God's pouring out His wrath on man. But another reason is to restore the Jewish people. In Romans it says their, their eyes have been blinded. It, you know, most Jewish people, some get saved today, but very few. But during this tribulation period, there's going to be multitudes of Jewish people saved. The Jews were rejected, but God said, I will restore you back. And you will look on whom you pierced and you will weep. They will weep because... They will see the error of their way. And they will return to Jesus Christ. And there will be great revival. Uh, I'm trying to think. What is the name of Jesus in the Hebrew? Yeshua. 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 They're going to turn to the Messiah. And uh, there will be great revival. And so part of it, the tribulation, is to bring the Jewish people back to God. But there'll be people saved of all languages and all tribes and all people during the tribulation. Any questions before we move on? Yes. Oh, what'll happen? Well, let me tell you what'll happen. Many of the people that get saved during the tribulation will be killed because they refuse to take the mark of the beast. And the Bible says that the beast will behead many people who refuse to take the mark of the beast. If you take the mark of the beast, you're, you're doomed. But there are going to be people that will die for their faith. They'll believe in Jesus. So what happens? The Bible says their spirit will go into heaven. And their body will, will be buried or you know whatever, cremated or buried. And the Bible in Revelation actually says that these saints cry out to God and they said, How long before you avenge our death? And Jesus said, Just a little bit longer. But the, the Bible teaches that when Jesus comes back to, to reign on earth, um, after he gets back here, uh, there will be a resurrection, another resurrection. If you study the Bible, there's several rever resurrections. And that's one of the things that the, the post-trib guys believe. It, it says, I think it's in Revelation where it says, after Jesus comes back, there'll be a, revela uh, a resurrection. And it said, blessed are they that are in the first resurrection. And they were saying, see, this is the first resurrection. And it's after Jesus comes back. So you people that believe in the rapture and the resurrection before the tribulation, the Bible clearly says this is the first resurrection. There's only one problem with that. It's not the first resurrection. Um, it is the first resurrection after Jesus becomes king on this earth. What happened in, Re in Matthew chapter 27? It says, after the resurrection of Jesus, what happened? Anybody know? The Old Testament saints were raised from the dead. It says, so there was, they were, they're already raised. They've already got their bodies. The Old Testament saints. So that was a, a, a resurrection that was before. So if you're saying this was the first resurrection, it, it wasn't because there's one in Matthew chapter 27. And so um, it's the first resurrection after. And it's, it's really comparing it to the end of the thousand years. There's going to be another resurrection. And that's of those who did not believe. And they're going to be judged at the great white throne judgment after the thousand years. Is this getting confusing to you? I know there's a lot to remember. So Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years. And then the old devil is going to be let loose and have one more war against, the devil, uh, against Christ. Christ will win. And then all the dead sinners will be raised from the dead. And their soul will meet their body. And their soul is in, in hell. But their body will join their soul and they'll be judged at the great white throne judgment. And then they're not going to go to hell. They're going to go to a place called the lake of fire, which is separate from hell. And the lake of fire is where they'll be forever and ever. You know what? The Bible says this great white throne judgment. It doesn't say where it is. 
It doesn't say. Some people think it's going to be in outer space somewhere. You know, I, I don't know. It may be on some other planet. I, the Bible doesn't really say it. It just said they will stand before a great white throne. But they will then be, and, and they'll be judged based on their works too. It's not going to be the same for everybody in hell. Some people will suffer more because of their wickedness. Everybody will suffer. It's going to be a horrible place, but some worse than others. Any other questions? Oh, isn't that a lovely thought? See, my, I gave you good news this morning. I'm only balancing it out, right? It's good news for us because we're going into heaven, right? Okay. So the post-trib, some people, a lot, some of the uh, churches like the Roman Catholic Church, many of them believe in a in an amillennial view, which is very symbolic. And a lot of that is because, let me give you a little history here. Remember, Revelation was not written until about 90, 95 AD. So the first, the early saints didn't have much to go on. And there was a guy named Origen who was a church father. He was kind of a weird guy, okay? By weird, he, he actually castigated himself because he thought he'd make him a better Christian. That's pretty weird. And so, uh, and uh, he thought that, that he wouldn't have any temptation or anything. But he taught in a symbolic, he, he, taught, he taught allegorically. And then there was another guy who started reading his stuff in the 5th century, and his name was St. Augustine. St. Augustine is considered the father of theology. He was a brilliant guy, but he also taught this. And Augustine was, a, was one of the early leaders in the Roman Catholic Church. And so the Roman Catholic Church adopted this view. And so um, for years they taught this view. And then we had the Reformation. The Reformation is when Martin Luther and some others rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church, said what you're teaching is not true, and they rebelled, and the Roman Catholic Church tried to kill them, but they couldn't, they, they killed some of them, but they didn't kill all of them. And they began teaching this new religion, and they rejected the Roman Catholic Church. And they started teaching salvation by faith, which the, the Roman Catholic Church was teaching, you're saved by doing good works. And so... When they came out of the Roman Catholic religion, they adopted some good things, but one of the things they kept believing was this position on um, a millennial view, which means we're in the kingdom right now, that the kingdom rules in our heart, and also this post-trib. And so today you have what you call reform theology. It comes from the word the reformers. And Reformed theology is basically predestination. They believe that you're either predestined to heaven or hell. And a lot of those people believe in a post-trib rapture. Not all of them, but a lot of them do believe that we'll go through the, the tribulation. And they get that from their history of uh, being all the way back to the Roman Catholic Church. But the Bible, here's some of the things. Look, and, and I'm going to close. We've got about six minutes, and I'm going to be through. Luke 21, 36, it says, see down there, number one, under problems with post-trib rapture. Listen to this. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that you may, not, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. He's talking about the tribulation. He's talking about all these things that are going to come. He's saying, he's saying, pray that you'll be counted worthy not to have to go through the tribulation. Now, there's one of the things that I want you to see is he is saying you can escape the tribulation. Now, there are some people that believe this. I'll throw this in here. Um, they believe that some Christians, not many people believe this, but some people do. Some Christians, if you're a good Christian, you love the Lord, you're serving God, you're faithful, you'll get to go in the rapture. But if you're a backslidden Christian, you've got to stay here and go through it. Uh, now, I don't hold to that view, but this is one of the verses that, that they say, see, you've got to be worthy. The only problem that I see is you're mixing works and grace. The only way I'm worthy of anything is the blood of Christ. I'm, I'm unworthy uh, 
to go to heaven. I'm unworthy to be called a Christian. It is only by the grace of God. So I believe it, it, we're worthy by grace. Um, look at Revelation 3.10 under that verse. Because I have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. It clearly says there that he's going to keep us from the hour of temptation. The Bible also says, and I didn't put all these verses down, that uh, God's children are not appointed unto wrath. And so um, uh, we believe uh, we're to comfort one another with the hope of the rapture. That we can rejoice and we can, if I said, comfort one another in the fact that we're going through the tribulation. How much comfort is that? See, that the Bible talks about the blessed hope. We've got a hope. We're looking for Jesus to come. And uh, he's going to rescue us from uh, the wrath. Uh, here's another problem with the uh, post-trib. There's no place for the judgment seat or the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, they believe this. They say, uh, I was talking to somebody, uh, and this young guy said, well, why don't you believe in the rapture? Oh, he said, oh, I believe in the rapture. I just believe it will be at the end. When Jesus is coming back on a white horse to rule and reign on the earth, they believe we're going to be zipped up, and then we're going to zip down. What's the purpose of it? We're going to be zipped up, zip, <laughs> zipped up, and then zoom. And where's the marriage supper of the Lamb? See, I believe we're going to have seven years of a celebration marriage supper of the Lamb. And I also believe that may be where we also divide up what we're going to rule. Where Jesus looks at our life and he says, uh, was your life wood, hay, or stubble? And he said, I'm going to put you as a ruler over many cities. Or I'm going to put you over a little neighborhood. Or, you know, you might have uh, three houses. over the, You know, we're all going to rule differently based on our works. And so the judgment seat of Christ is where... He rewards us for our works. We get crowns. What are those crowns? That means we're going to reign as a king. Well, we're going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. And that, that may be true. But still we're going to have the authority of those crowns that God gives us. So we're living on earth. We're just earning crowns. You know there is a crown. Uh, the Bible teaches for pastors. There's a special crown for pastors. That's the one I want. There is a special crown for martyrs. I don't care as much for that one. Uh, but people that die for Jesus will get a special crown. So we're going to be rewarded. And I think that's what's going to happen during the, while the tribulations down here. We're going to be up there getting our rewards, getting ready to come back with Jesus, to rule and reign with Him. We're going to be celebrating, singing, praising, dancing at a wedding, supper, feasting. Praise God, there's going to be eating in heaven. Amen? Some good food. What's that? <laughs> so, uh, if you believe in the post trib, there's no time for that. Because we just go right up, and then we come right back down. Don't figure, I don't know. Uh, don't know how that works. Uh, if you believe in the post trib that means the Jews and the church are going to be together going through the tribulation and I believe they're going to be separate um, where's the promise to take us to the Father's house? Jesus said I'm going to take you to the Father's house when the post trib we zip up, zip down, we never go to the Father's house I want to go to the Father's house He said He's going to take us Jesus is going to keep His promise and take us to the Father's house so um, He said He was preparing a place for us we're up in heaven I want to go up there, even if it's just seven years. I want to go up there and uh, see the Father's house and be a part of that. Um, again, what is the purpose of a rapture? If you're just going to go up and come back down. In Revelation it says, He saw the Lord coming out of heaven and His army with Him. Where they're coming from? Heaven. I believe we're going to go to heaven for, and come from heaven down to the earth. Um, Again, there's no church mentioned in Revelation 6 through 18. We talked about that. The post trib turns the blessed hope into the blasted hope. In other words, we're going to get blasted by God. We're going to go through the wrath of God. Um, 
It, it again denies the doctrine of eminence. Oh, here's a good one. Who's going to populate the earth during the, the thousand year reign of Christ? If the rapture takes place, and we know this, because Paul taught when the rapture takes place, the dead in Christ shall be raised first, and their bodies are going to be changed into an incorruptible body. And I talked about that the first night. I talked about this great body, awesome body we're going to have. It's going to be incorruptible. It's going to be supernatural. It can go into outer space. It can handle, it's like a space suit. It's, it's going to be an awesome body. But those bodies are unable to reproduce. You remember Jesus said up in heaven, there is no marriage or giving in marriage. So if the rapture takes place at the post-trib, then everybody who comes into the kingdom is going to have a new glorified body. Well, who's going to have all these babies and populate the earth during the kingdom? 